Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my privilege to welcome you all to the 2013 6th Chicago International Education Conference. My name is Andy Gron. I am the Assistant Director for Programs of the Center for International Studies, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. Before turning the floor over to our keynote speaker, Jenny Bukos, I want to take a moment to mention and thank the co-sponsoring organizations and the representatives of those organizations who are here this morning and to say a few words about educator outreach programs at the university. Throughout, please feel free to help yourself to more coffee, juice, water, pastries, etc. cetera. Uh, this will be an informal talk, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what other opportunities exist for you as educators at the university. So, uh, uh, I represent the Center for International Studies, uh, one of the many area centers at the University of Chicago campus. And the Center for International Studies, along with university area centers and other uh, organizations, have a long tradition of sponsoring educator outreach opportunities for the Chicago area, especially teacher professional development workshops such as the one we are at today, in addition to other events. Today's conference was brought to you by a number of really wonderful co-sponsoring organizations, most of whom have tables set up along the sides of the room and representatives. I encourage you all to meet with and talk with the representatives of these organizations. They have their own tailored outreach programs. So if you're interested in specific areas or specific topics, they are tremendous resources for you all to consult and utilize. We have uh, the Center for East Asian Studies the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies, which is represented today by Meredith Clayson uh, over here. The Center for Latin American Studies, represented by Rary Rivas uh, near the front here. The Center for Middle Eastern Studies, represented by Alex Barna, who is just walking through the doors behind you all. Uh, Alex will also be leading one of the breakout sessions later in the afternoon. Uh, we then have an outside sponsor, the arts outreach organization Changing Worlds, uh, who graciously is co-sponsoring today's event and will also be leading a breakout session in the afternoon. Uh, we also uh, must thank International House, represented today by Mary Beth DiStefano. Uh, we are in their facilities, and in addition to supporting events like this, they have a wonderful array of cultural programs. Uh, I urge you all to consult uh, uh, their calendar for upcoming events. Uh, in addition, the University of Chicago Neighborhood Schools Program, an office of civic engagement, uh, represented by Shaz Razul, who will follow me uh, in offering a, a brief welcome to today's event, uh, are here to uh, uh, sponsoring this uh, uh, international education conference. And then we have the South Asia, Southern Asia at Chicago uh, Area Center, represented by Deanna Ramsey in the back. Uh, in addition, the Smart Museum, which will be represented by Lisa Davis later in the day, who along with Carol ng -hee from the Oriental Institute will be leading our uh, uh, fourth breakout session in the afternoon. I wanted to take the time to introduce you to these organizations and to their representatives because I think one of the great opportunities that a conference like this presents is not only to talk with your colleagues and peers uh, from other schools across the Chicagoland area, uh, but also to talk with some of the staff here at the University of Chicago who can support your teaching. And all of the people I just mentioned do an excellent job of doing just that. So I really urge you, if you have an interest in Latin American studies, talk to Arreri. If you have an interest in Middle Eastern Studies, Alex uh, is here, etc. cetera. Uh, much of the world is covered by our area centers. We have uh, archaeology and the ancient world represented by the Oriental Institute. We have arts education represented by Changing Worlds and the Smart Museum. So please take advantage of the, the valuable uh, resources uh, embodied in these fine people who are here with us today. Now I would like to move on to talk about some of the ways in which the University of Chicago works to support educators in the Chicagoland area. We have a variety of educator outreach programs. Uh, the area centers at the University of Chicago and supporting organizations like the Smart Museum and the Oriental Institute regularly offer professional development workshops such as the one we are at today. By and large, almost all of these are uh, free of charge uh, as long as you register in advance. Uh, and it's one way in which the university tries to support area teachers and educators. 
In addition, it is possible to arrange campus and museum visits at the university, in particular the Oriental Institute Museum and the Smart Museum uh, uh, regularly facilitate uh, visits by classes, for example, and have educational materials and outreach materials if you want to take advantage of these really fine institutions located on the University of Chicago campus. And again, if you have interest in specific uh, world areas, uh, the outreach coordinators uh, and staff of our area centers can help facilitate tailored visits to the university as well. So I urge you to consult with the representatives of our uh, sponsoring organizations here today. Uh, we also at the university have a large variety of cultural and educational programming sponsored by today's uh, uh, co-sponsoring organizations. For example, as I've already mentioned, International House regularly has wonderful uh, arts performances uh, and public lectures through their Global Voices programming. In addition, uh, all of the, the area centers also have their own public programs where you can have scholars, newsmakers, etc., offering in-depth perspectives uh, on uh, events of interest um, to us all to be sure. Uh, another way in which uh, University of Chicago organizations can help support you uh, is by providing information. And each of the centers uh, sponsoring today's event run uh, educator e-bulletins where you can be kept abreast of uh, grant opportunities, fellowship opportunities, professional development opportunities, and the cultural programs that I just mentioned. So again, if you have a specific interest in any of the areas represented by our sponsoring organizations, I urge you to sign up to their e-bulletins so you can uh, be made aware of opportunities uh, that are upcoming uh, uh, and sponsored by the University of Chicago or merely happening elsewhere in the Chicago area. Uh, finally, it is possible to have scholars visit classrooms. Uh, again, I urge you to contact representatives of the sponsoring organizations uh, if should this be something that interests you. Uh, in addition, for several years now, every summer, typically in June, uh, the area centers and uh, other organizations at the University of Chicago join together for a three-day Summer Teacher Institute. Uh, this is one of the hallmarks of our professional development opportunities at the university. Uh, news will be forthcoming on uh, next year's, the 2014 Summer Teacher Institute, but I wanted to at least place this on the radar. It's a great opportunity to earn CPDUs and to really immerse yourself in a topic. And just a brief moment, I'll say just a few more words about our summer teacher institutes. And then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, each of our area centers, including the Center for International Studies, has a large variety of online lesson plans and teaching materials available on our websites. Typically, uh, after a professional development workshop that we sponsor, uh, lesson plans that result from that workshop, uh, PowerPoints, uh, suggested readings, bibliographies, etc., are placed online. You can access them free of charge, and it can support your own lesson plan development. Uh, you can have ideas to adapt, uh, to work with, to work against, however you go about organizing your own classes. So I wanted to make you aware of these wonderful opportunities. Again, visit our website, cis.uchicago.edu, uh, or our co-sponsoring organizations' websites to find more information on online teaching materials and lesson plans. To walk you through just one case, I wanted to give you a little survey of what we have available on the Center for International Studies website, uh, which can help you internationalize your classroom, as we like to say. Specifically, we have a sub-site dedicated to educator outreach uh, that's encased within uh, our center's uh, webpage. You can find these educator outreach resources at cis.uchicago slash outreach. Uh, we have a list of past and upcoming teacher workshops. We have sites from past summer teacher institutes which have an amazing array of uh, lesson plans and other resources available to you. Uh, there's also uh, downloadable resources as you can see and you can subscribe to our outreach newsletter uh, to be kept aware of upcoming uh, events and opportunities for educators. So I invite you all to explore our uh, outreach portal. I hope you'll find resources that that are useful and interesting to you. And of course, we'd love to hear any feedback from you should you find something especially useful, should you have adapted something from our website. We'd love to hear stories about how it's been useful. It really uh, helps support us in our effort to, to provide this type of support to area teachers. 
I also wanted to specifically highlight uh, the past sites of our Summer Teacher Institute. As I mentioned, this is a three-day event that happens typically every June following the end of the school year. Uh, each Summer Teacher Institute is dedicated to a specific theme. We typically choose themes that are interdisciplinary that can span the social sciences as well as the natural sciences. You can see here a list of past Summer Teacher Institutes. Last year's was on natural disasters. Before that, food scarcity, migration, water, climate change, the global economy, epidemics. And if you access the archive of past Summer Teacher Institutes through the Center for International Studies outreach page, you will find recordings of the many speakers who presented at each of these Summer Teacher Institutes. You will find their bibliographies, suggested readings, resources, uh, PowerPoints that they had prepared for their presentations, in addition to lesson plans that were specifically developed by educators drawing upon talks and materials uh, 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 included in the Summer Teacher Institute. So if any of these topics interest you in your own teaching, they're in a tremendous resource. You can send your students to find information uh, on any of these topics there as well. So I just wanted to highlight these resources as something that we take great pride in here at the University of Chicago. The Summer Teacher Institute, as I mentioned, is always a collaboration among our area centers uh, and allied uh, organizations on campus. Uh, and we hope that these materials will be of use to you uh, and that you will continue to find uh, a value uh, in the sources that were resources that were prepared for past summer teacher institutes. I also wanted to take the opportunity to mention the current programming theme of the Center for International Studies, which is on the topic of global energies. Uh, the Center for International Studies has our own resource table uh, at the very back corner of this room, and you can find a flyer that gives you a detailed list of the talks, films, uh, uh, and, and other programs that we have upcoming. Uh, we are focusing on the politics, ecology, and science of energy in the 21st century. Uh, currently, we have a theme focusing on, uh, a programming focusing on hydraulic fracturing and its environmental effects. Uh, indeed, next Monday, here at the International House at 6 p.m., uh, we are co-sponsoring a Global Voices program in which journalist Alex Pudholm will be visiting to talk on his newly released book, Hydro fracking what everyone needs to know. Uh, we hope to see many of you there should this be a topic that interests you. It is, of course, quite controversial, so having informed perspectives can be of tremendous value. In the winter, we'll turn to look at biofuels, uh, so think corn ethanol, uh, sugar cane, uh, oil palm, etc., being used uh, as a fuel source, and think about the impacts, ecological, social, etc., of this fuel source. And then finally, in the spring, we'll have a set of programs on the future of energy, looking at fossil fossil fuels and beyond. So I really am winding things up here. I just wanted to uh, direct you all to some resources for further information. Uh, of course, uh, talk with the people here today. Um, first person contact is always such a tremendous opportunity. Visit their website, sign up for their newsletters. Uh, uh, in addition, you can visit our website, cis.uchicago.edu, uh, for a survey of at least some events happening at the University of Chicago. Recently, the area centers and museums joined together to create a page uh, that gives a showcase of upcoming outreach opportunities at the University of Chicago. It is k12outreach.uchicago.edu, uh, currently being coordinated by Carol Enghe of the Oriental Institute. Uh, it's still in uh, beta form, uh, but you can uh, uh, bookmark it and consult it and you'll see uh, uh, at least announcements of upcoming uh, professional development uh, events and other opportunities. And of course, please always feel free to contact me, Andy Gron, uh, the Assistant Director for Programs of the Center for International Study. Uh, my email is right here. I have business cards uh, at the very back table. Stop and talk with me throughout the day. I'm happy to do what I can to support you. So this is it for me. I would now like to turn the floor over to uh, Shaz Razul, who is the Director of Community Programs in the Office of Civic Engagement here at the University of Chicago. And he has a long history of overseeing the Neighborhood Schools Program at the University. And he'll say just a few words to welcome you all to today's event. Thank you, Andy. 
that's an amazing list of things, and that's the tip of the iceberg as far as what's going on at the University of Chicago. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the University of Chicago this morning. Uh, we fancy ourselves as an intellectual destination, and what that what that looks like in reality is is we think we think that we're a key node in a really interesting conversation that's happening in between lots of different scholars and practitioners and people and communities and schools and institutions. We're imagining a, a huge learning exchange where we're sharing information from the university and we're getting information and insight uh, from the community. And, and today's a prime example of, of that kind of thinking. Uh, you all will bring so much to, to, to today's program, as much or more, uh, well, as much probably, because these, these presenters are pretty impressive today. Uh, but you'll bring a lot to this program, and we're looking forward to seeing what develops out of this. Um, from, from the Office of Civic Engagement, um, I would like to highlight one program in addition to, to the work that uh, Andy has talked about. And I, I think everybody's got a UChicago Promise flyer. If not, there are some at the back table. Uh, last year, the university uh, decided to make, make a point of consolidating a number of our programs that really focus on developing a college-going culture and, and supporting Chicago's kids as they're trying to reach uh, higher education. Uh, the news really grasp, grabbed on to the no loan pledge that we made to students from Chicago who would enter the University of Chicago, uh, which is, of course, no, no small thing. Uh, but I would like to highlight a whole range of additional programming that looks beyond students that are going to attend the university. Uh, we're, we are facilitating a number of sessions around essay writing and financial aid for high school students, regardless of what university they, they decide to go to. We feel like there's an information gap, and, and as systems are being stretched, particularly the Chicago public school system, anything we can do to help get good information and support to kids and families and schools uh, it just makes everybody's life better. And so that, that's where we're, where we're trying to go. Uh, the UChicago Promise flyer and the website promise.uchicago.edu details a list of different programs and opportunities across the spectrum, uh, both in the, you know, definitely in the inter international studies and culture uh, sections, but also in STEM, uh, college preparation, uh, and other kinds of enrichment, both academic and, and personal. So with that, I'd like to say once again, welcome to the University of Chicago. Thank you for being part of our community. Uh, thank you for uh, working, uh, deciding that this is a topic that's worthwhile to bring back to your schools. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back over to Andy. Thank you. Before introducing uh, Jenny, I just want to say a few words about the organization of today's event, uh, the agenda, as well as just to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, you all should have received a conference agenda in your folder. Uh, we begin the morning with two uh, uh, two talks, uh, of course, by Jenny Bukos, followed by Adar Cohen. Uh, we will then have lunch provided in this room. Uh, and following lunch, there will be uh, two breakout sessions. And you have four breakout sessions to choose from. And each of these breakout sessions will repeat. So in essence, each of you will have the opportunity to visit two of the breakout sessions, one at 12.10 p.m., the other at 1.20 p.m. You'll see on the back of the conference agenda a list of the breakout sessions. I encourage you to look at the descriptions, to talk with the people who will be leading these. Uh, and after lunch, as I said, we'll begin the first breakout session. All four will be taking place at that time. You can choose one to attend. And then again, in the second breakout session at 120, all four breakout sessions will repeat. So you can visit another breakout session from the one you first visited. Uh, so if you're here with uh, colleagues from your school, you may wish to perhaps divide labor, go to different breakout sessions so you can share ideas, so on and so forth. Um, but we hope that you will find, or we're certain you will find, um, some really great opportunities um, for thinking about how the topic of global citizenship can be uh, integrated into your teaching, whether you uh, work in the social sciences, uh, in arts education, um, uh, 
uh, or uh, how, how uh, ever uh, uh, you, you, your teaching may go. Um, I also wanted to highlight one other thing that is added in your folders. You will have noticed there's a flyer for the American Anthropological Association's Anthropologist Back to School event. As it happens, the American Anthropology Association is having their annual meeting here in Chicago uh, later in the month. And on Wednesday, November 20th, at many um, museums uh, and cultural organizations across the city of Chicago, there will be anthropologists in attendance having special educational sessions uh, available for class visits, for teacher visits. Uh, you have a full array of information available on that handout. I encourage you to take advantage of this wonderful uh, uh, out of the blue opportunity. It's a great way in which you can expose uh, your students to uh, a cultural education, looking at uh, a world contexts uh, and, and world cultures uh, from a variety of different places. So I just wanted to highlight this opportunity to you all. Uh, and finally, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, I should mention that International House, among other things, is a residence hall. International students at the University of Chicago live here. And the main common area out in the front is technically designated as a resident area uh, for residents to study, uh, 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 among other things. And so we ask that during lunchtime, if you stay in this room to eat, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we don't want to encroach uh, on uh, the residence space uh, in order to respect that this is their living quarters, among other things, so I ask that you do that uh, for us. Uh, in addition, there's uh, restrooms uh, out in the lobby. You go through the doors and down the stairs. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, our breakout sessions uh, will be in three rooms in addition to this one. There will be the home room, which is on the second floor on this side of the building. And then uh, the other two rooms, the Tiffin Conference Room and the Coulter Lounge, are down the long hallway on the other side of the building. We will have have staffs and signs that help direct you, but just to warn you that there will be a bit of a walk, uh, not a long walk just down the hallway, but a bit of a walk to some of the breakout sessions in the afternoon. Uh, with those things mentioned, uh, it's now my great honor to introduce Ms. Jenny M. Bukos, our keynote speaker for today. Jenny M. Bukos is a multi-award winning director and producer. In 2003, if you can imagine, before the existence of YouTube, she founded ProjectExplorer.org, a free multimedia website designed uh, uh, to educate primary and secondary school students about global cultures and histories. Over the last 10 years, she has directed and produced nearly 500 short films for ProjectExplorer.org, working with leaders in world-renowned organizations, including Nobel Laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the British Museum, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, and the Azerbaijan National Agency for Mine Action. She has spoken at three TEDx conferences and regularly lectures on the importance of global competency in primary and second education. She is the two-time recipient of the Gold Parents' Choice Award for Excellence in Educational Programming. She is a 2010 recipient of a National Award for Citizen Diplomacy, honored alongside Academy Award winner Robert Redford for her work as a citizen diplomat. In July 2012, she was recognized by the Obama administration as a White House champion for change. In February 2013, Bukos was recognized as one, as one of the National School Board Association's 20 to Watch. This award recognizes emerging leaders within the ed tech community who have the potential to impact the film for the next 20 years. She's joining us after a recent trip to India. We are tremendously lucky to have Jenny Bukos join us today, and she will be speaking on the topic Filming the World, How ProjectExplorer.org Brings the World into Your Classroom. Please join me in welcoming Jenny Bukos. Okay, thanks. Good morning. Andy, thank you for that wonderful, uh, let me grab some water here, this is going to be a long, a long stay. <laughs> uh, Andy, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'd like to start off by thanking the University of Chicago and CIS for having me this morning. Um, about 12 days ago, I was in India, so I'm still a bit jet lagged. Um, so this is evening for me, which is my, my sweet spot. So you're getting me at my best, I think. Um, when I was invited to participate in this conference, I wasn't sure how I was going to fill more than an hour. 
my profession as a filmmaker, I spend most of my professional life listening to other people talk. My language is that of images, trying to capture a moment that will allow my viewers to see the world in a different light. So with that, I'd like to start this morning off with two images and talk a little bit about perspective. Many of you probably have a map like this somewhere in your classroom. This is a picture of the world we all likely have lodged somewhere in our brains. We've all seen this map, and seeing it so often has led us to make certain assumptions about our world. For example, it's common to see headlines like this. These headlines were on the first page of my web search earlier this week. I didn't even need to go on beyond, beyond the first page. Africa is an enormous region of 55 countries and more than 2,100 languages are spoken. It cannot sensibly, sensibly be viewed as a single entity, yet this is how we far too often view the continent. Okay, so Africa, as the Washington Post and The Economist recently pointed out, is much bigger than most of us think. As you can see, China would fit pretty much in the central to southern uh, part of the continent, and the entire continental U.S. fits up in uh, the western central Africa region. Now, I know I'm comparing the African continent uh, to countries here, but it's interesting for me to see the sheer size next to common references. So what do these two images say to you? They tell me we need to think more about the pictures we're using and the stories we're telling our students. With better storytelling and better images, we can be educating our kids on the world as it really is and not just providing one perspective. Okay, so why did I start today with a mini geography lesson? Well, I have two goals um, for my time with you this morning. And the first is to leave you with something tangible, projectexplorer.org, that you can take back to your classroom next week and start using immediately. And the second is to get you to start thinking like filmmakers and film producers, which hopefully will lead you to creating your own images and stories that will offer your students multiple perspectives on the world. Okay, so as Andy said, I'm the director, producer, and series creator of projectexplore.org. We're a nonprofit multimedia company founded in 2003 with the aim to bring the world into the classroom with free multimedia content and lesson plans that improve students' global awareness and cross-cultural understanding. Since our inception, we've been at the forefront of the global education movement in primary and secondary schools by creating and distributing nearly 500 videos, nearly 1,800 images, um, close to 1,700 educational blogs and written materials. We're not solely a, a film company. We also produce written materials because we believe writing, uh, reading and writing is still important, um, and 175 cross-curricular lesson plans. We are not content aggregators. Everything on our website is completely original and free of charge. Um, that said, there'll be another 75 videos and 25 lesson plans by the end of 2014 because we just finished this eight country round the world trip um, filming on four continents. But before I talk about Project Explore, it might be helpful to understand where I'm coming from um, and my background and how it inspired and informed my work in the global education movement because I consider myself a very unlikely person to be talking on this subject today. I grew up here, and this I consider the icebreaker. When you put up a baby picture of yourself, you kind of have the audience, so. <laughs> I grew up here in upstate New York, four hours outside of New York City in a town called Fonda. It was a farming community, and at the time, Fonda had a population of 800 people, 98% of which were white, so diversity was not a very big thing. Most of our newspapers and television news pretty much consisted of things that happened within a 50-mile radius of our town. Looking back on my childhood and my young adult life, I can only recall a few international stories that received significant media attention. The fall of the Berlin Wall, now you all know how old I am, <laughs> um, Tiananmen Square. This type of news coverage was common in small town America when I was a child. Things that happened to people you knew or people in your town were important. Things that happened outside of your community, outside of your sphere, happened to other people and weren't much talked about. Growing up, my family and I took trips up and down the east coast of the United States, once to Canada and once to Mexico. While this might not seem unusual today, at the time we were the most well-traveled people in town. Yeah. 
These trips and my limited in international media exposure were the sum total of my worldview. Traveling abroad was never something that was encouraged in school, nor was it something I as aspired to do. By the time I completed university, I really hadn't seen much of the world. So in 1999, I uh, moved to New York City, and I briefly toyed with the idea of becoming a theater producer, a Broadway producer. Um, I had studied in Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare in school, until I found out that Broadway producers sort of needed their own money to bankroll shows, so that dream ended very, very fast. I went to work as a temp at a major investment bank, uh, just to make ends meet, and in 2000, I was hired as a full-time employee, and they asked me if I wanted to go work in Asia, and I said, I don't have a passport. So that led me to applying for my first passport in the year 2000. I was sent to Hong, to Hong Kong and Tokyo, and those two cities immediately changed me. It was a total culture shock, and I was fascinated by everything I encountered. I became interested in learning everything about these two cities, their history, their culture, their past, their traditions. This was the start of my global education. And around the same time, I was introduced to Michael Palin's travel documentaries. Yes, he's the guy from Monty Python. Um, <laughs> they used to air on PBS and the BBC, and PBS was the only thing I got with my rabbit ear television. Um, while he visited many of the places I had seen in textbooks before, watching him describe a new place as he experienced it was almost as powerful and created a personal connection nearly as strong as being there myself. So what did Michael Palin's adventures do for me? Well, I started to learn about, I started to think about how learning could be more engaging and more relevant using the power of storytelling and imagery and how this approach could help students learn more about their world. And right about this time, when I was starting to get deeply inspired about what the world had to offer, I was in New York City on September 11th. And in many ways, these events drew America's attention to the world around us for, a first for the first time in a very long time. We as a country started asking a lot of questions, in particular questions on the Middle East and Islam. And these questions, we frankly didn't have the answers to. And the more I watched our news and observed the people around me in my own life, the more I'm worried about what this was doing to the American psyche. Students were now growing up in a society where anything foreign was quite literally something to be feared. And this didn't match the experience that I had had, the limited experience I had had traveling the world. And I wanted to do something to help grow an understanding across cultures. I wanted everyone to experience the world in the same way I had. Now I know that's naive, but I especially wanted to give that experience to students. So in 2003, I began Project Explore to provide students and educators with virtual passports, especially for those for whom travel is simply not possible as a way to make the foreign less so. Okay, so as Andy said, um, you can imagine I faced numerous challenges in starting Project Explorer in 2003. Uh, the first was in developing an online resource before online, con video was, uh, online video consumption was mainstream. And to give you some sense, here's what YouTube looked like in 2005. That's it, that's their homepage in 2005. Uh, its first content debuted in April of that year, and here's what Project Explorer looked like in 2005. Online video was extremely new and most individuals had barely uh, seen it. It certainly hadn't, hadn't made its way into the classroom, so when I launched and I went out and spoke to teachers, you can imagine the looks I got. You're gonna do what for my classroom? They had no understanding of what I was doing. Um, aside from the online issue, another challenge in starting Project Explore was based largely on perceptions and attitudes. Free was viewed with skepticism. People would say to me, so it's free this year and I'm gonna get charged next year, I'm not gonna use it. Um, and global understanding was not viewed as essential. Between, two, uh, between late 2001 and 2003, there were numerous studies conducted on global education in American schools, and this was largely as a result of 9-11 um, and the subsequent increase on international media attention in the Middle East. And these are some of their findings. So after 18 months of research and a year and a half of content production, Project Explorer officially launched in 2006 in our first series focused on Shakespeare's England. 
not very provocative, but I selected this location for several reasons. One, as I said, I studied Shakespeare in school, so I knew, I knew the content uh, like the back of my hand. Um, and still being a relatively inexperienced traveler, uh, traveler, England was easy. You speak the language, you can get around. Um, first time filmmaker, first time doing anything in this world. Let's pick something um, where there are no language barriers and you can eat the food. Um, so Shakespeare was a subject matter, obviously, that I was familiar with, and nearly every school covers Shakespeare at some point, so it was a really easy sell to the teachers in terms of content, just not in terms of delivery. So what did teachers coming to Project Explorer in 2006 experience? So everything we do is done three times. It's done for the upper elementary or third to fifth grade level, middle school to sixth to eighth grade level, or high school ninth to twelfth grade. So once you've selected what grade level you're at, um, you come to a blog page, and it's an educational blog. And that's what's down the center. And you can see embedded within those blogs are some yellow words. This is designed very much like Wikipedia. Again, it's all original content. If you don't understand what the Tower of London is, you click on it, and I'll show you on the next slide. Um, a definition is going to come up for you as a student. Um, the video assets are, are placed down the right hand side and then the navigation is placed on the left and the idea is it was a virtual field trip so you would join us day one as we arrived in London your storyteller is one of the people who are in front of the camera for me you follow them through their entire journey all of their experiences so you just navigate down the left as we go um, all of the images are original so it's, it's it was intended to be a very dynamic if you learn best by reading you had reading material if you learn best by seeing and hearing you had video if you needed additional background information again you you had the keywords. So that's what a pop-up keyword looks like. Everything on the site is self-contained, so you're not sending anyone to external links. Again, making it very easy to get around school firewalls, things of that nature. Um, and again, everything is tailored to the grade level, so all of these keywords would have to be written three times based on where you are in terms of your academic um, career. Videos pop up the same way, and all of the videos are kept under five minutes because that's about the time a teacher has to introduce something into the classroom. It's about the attention span of people today, to be honest with you. Um, and we tried to keep them one, one theme. So if you're interviewing someone like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you're not going to put 20 minutes up. You're going to ask him three questions, and you're going to create three separate videos based on each of those questions so educators can stop in between and say, did you understand? Let's move on to the next concept that's going to build on the first video you watched. And with all of that came lesson plans free lesson plans. Um, these were laid out the exact same way, so you would navigate right down the, the left-hand side and follow along with your students. Now, this one is very simplistic in design, but this is 2006, so Common Core wasn't really around. Again, we were first time. We had no idea we had to align these things to state standards, and we had university students writing our lesson plans for us. So these were university students who were teaching in the classroom, who were required to bring new materials into the classroom, and say, would say to me, well, I'll just write the lesson plan. I'm already using it in the classroom. Um, today the site is similar instruction, all of the various assets are still provided, lesson plans, video content, keywords, and educational blogs. Um, it's, gotten, it's gotten a little spiffed up and we're working on spiffing it up a little more, um, but it's also mobile device compatible. But there have been major changes in the focus of the content and that, when we as an or that came when we as an organization began to look at our mission and what we meant by global awareness. So the more I immerse myself in international news and global issues, I noticed that this was what was missing from, global ed from education. Not to say that our initial approach with Shakespeare was wrong, it's still heavily used by literature teachers, but there was a shift in my own global understanding. Add that to two additional years of working with educators, and we as an organization got closer to defining what global citizenship meant to our work. In early 2007, we shifted our focus from virtual field trip, which very much lives in the world of museums and landmarks, to one of asking questions and sharing stories. We moved beyond solely focusing on the past, focusing on history, to covering antiquity to current events, social issues, and everything in between. So the first step in doing this was moving beyond the five Fs. I think you all know what I'm talking about when I say the five Fs. <laughs> Um, now, these are a good gateway or springboard for cultural um, appreciation, and we still incorporate these elements into our work. 
But if these are the sum total of our approach to global un uh, understanding, it would be a bit like having an international news broadcast that only celebrates the positive. And once we move beyond this very surface level approach, we had to assess what globally competent meant. Ooh. There we go. Most of you have probably read Educating for Global Competence. Has anyone read that? It was published in 2011 by the Asia Society. Okay. This report outlined that globally competent students should be able to do four things. These are those four things. We began focusing our lessons in a similar way in 2008, so three years before that paper was published. But these four, these four clearly defined competencies are now what we use as guidelines for all of our lesson plans and all of our videos as long, uh, alongside the Common Core Standards. And with this new focus, Project Explorer has created content on the following countries. So now, because I'm a filmmaker, I'm going to give you a little sample of what it is we do. Um, and the four, the four clips that I've selected to uh, show you um, are issues that we explore in our series, and these are intended for a high school audience. I am at Guzdek with representatives from the Azerbaijan National Agency for Mine Action, where we're learning about their efforts to educate the population and clear the land for UXOs, which are unexploded ordinances. Here at this site, they're using a specialized team to remove UXOs and landmines buried in the ground, a process that's often called demining. They're not landmines, but UXOs are highly dangerous. Unexploded ordinances are explosive devices like bombs, grenades, or machine gun bullets that haven't been fired or detonated. UXOs and landmines are a worldwide problem in areas where there has been military combat. They're often left behind after the fighting has ended, but they remain at risk of exploding. Before leaving this area, the Soviet troops exploded this military base, which caused a lot of enormous explosives and unexploded ordinances to scatter everywhere here. In 2012, the world produced 491 million tons of rice. Exactly how much rice is that? 491 million tons is equal to 982 billion pounds. Divide all that rice up equally among the 7.1 billion people living on the planet last year, and you get 138 pounds per person per year. That's enough rice to give every person on the planet two servings every single day. I'm here at Daravi. It's one of the largest slums in all of Asia, where about a million people live and work in 1.75 kilometers squared. It's located right in the center of Mumbai, and I'm going to meet Fahim, a local tour guide who's going to show me around. In Daravi, recycling is big business. This single industry accounts for almost $1 billion in annual economic output and employs nearly a quarter of a million people. The recycling process begins with rag pickers who sift and sort through piles of rubbish in search of recyclable materials like metal, glass, and plastic. These materials are then sold as scrap to dealers in Daravi, who process the waste and resell it to either be recycled or reused. So you're going to hear some banging, and that's because we've walked into one of the small areas of the very large recycling industry here in Daravi, where they're bringing in used paint cans, and they heat them up, remove the paint from the inside, peel off the labels, and then this guy over here, he's going to bang out the dents, and then they treat the outside with red oxide and sell it back to the paint companies. The next days, right after the tsunami, when I was still in hospital with my pelvis broken, I had this incredible urge to, to go back and help those who are looking for their loved ones, um, help those who uh, lost everything, their homes, their livelihoods, help them to um, gather the pieces together, help them to find food, help them to, to, um, to give them a little joy so soon as I 
could walk again. The first trip which I did was um, back to Thailand. Um, while being in Thailand already, which was um, four months after um, the tsunami, uh, we could see that the first responders were leaving and the communities and, and families were left alone without support. Um, and that's the first time when I seen the gap which happens after first responders leave and before the communities are rebuilt. And I've seen it in many countries since. Okay, so these subject areas might not be shocking to you because being here demonstrates that you're already interested in global understanding. But these topics are not typically filmed with, a, with an aim to inform a young audience. So with this shift in video content, our lesson plans also had to change. We began filming in places that educators most likely had not visited, especially when you talk about places like Azerbaijan or Zambia, and that can be scary to an educator. People who had used our Shakespeare series began to approach me with concerns on how they were going to teach some of the places and topics we were covering. So with that, we started incorporating background information and pre-lesson pri pre -lesson primers for educators so that they felt more comfortable dealing with the subject matter. So that's the shift I'm talking about in lesson plans. We went from that single half page to seven pages of information for every single lesson plan we provide. Uh, standards and benchmarks are also provided as our assessment rub uh, rubrics so you understand uh, where your students should be after each lesson. And this is something that we're continuing to retrofit for all of our lesson plans over the next year. So the 175 that we have, only about 50 have been done, um, but as I said, we're a, we're a nonprofit, so we're dealing with volunteer educators doing this because they're using these resources in their classroom anyhow. Um, we're working with about 50 volunteer educators, ranging from the National Social Studies Teacher of the Year last year to educators in China um, assisting us. So a quick recap, you've got several hundred short videos that are created by a multi-award winning film crew with 10 years of experience. You have top educators contributing lesson plans, many of which align to the Common Core. Everything is free, so why do we have just 5 million students or 10% of the US student population using Project Explore? Well, in 2011, we commissioned a survey to better understand the landscape. And over the last decade, despite some extraordinary strides being made by some schools and some teachers, as a country, we haven't made much progress in terms of global learning, and you can imagine why. Teachers tell us they're strapped for classroom resources that would let them innovate in their classroom. Global education is still linked to travel, which is considered a luxury, and many consider that to be something students will eventually get to do if they choose to. And the increased focus on testing means many teachers feel they have to address the basics first. Okay, so with that in mind, please take out your mobile phones. We're gonna do a little poll. And I hope it's, ah. You don't, I'm not online. <laughs> Is it supposed to come right up? It's supposed to come right up. Sorry. Okay, so we're, you can put your mobile phones away because we're having a little bit of a technical problem. This worked in the hotel last night, but we're not on a secure connection. So we're going to do this old school and we're just going to raise our hands. <laughs> I can do this off the top of my head. Um, so, four answers here. Do you regularly incorporate global themes beyond the five Fs into your classroom? If you regularly do that, can you please raise your hand for me? So take a look around the room. You can see how many people, roughly. Sometimes, who sometimes incorporates? Okay, rarely. 
Never. That's good. What do you think students said? Okay, so earlier this year, we conducted a nationwide survey of 223 students or recent students ages 13 to 25. The goal of the survey was to explore perceived the perceived importance and impact of global studies to current and former students. And here's how they answered that question regarding their education. Oh. There we go. Of those 223 students, only 12% strongly agreed that their teachers take a global approach to their education when it comes to lessons. And in the absence of global education in the classroom, students seek it out themselves. We found that our, our survey, um, in our survey, we found that nearly three quarters of students, or 73%, actively seek out information about world events outside of their classrooms. So. I'm going to skip the next one, but I'm going to let you just think about it for a second. If you could give your students um, more instruction time in just one area, what would it be? Just think about that sort of in your heads, because there are so many subjects to sort of deal with. Here's how students responded to that same question. So you can see world events and foreign languages are the top two areas that they're asking for more instruction time. And the higher level importance students are placing on cross-cultural understanding, in this case, world events and foreign languages, compared to other subjects is based in part on their belief that an understanding of other countries and cultures will contribute to the development of a better world and future job opportunities. Okay, so why did we invest time in doing this as a small nonprofit? Why did we invest time in both of these studies? Well, we wanted to demonstrate Learning the basics does not have to come at the expense of learning about other countries and cultures. Now, I know to you that sounds like a no-brainer, but I hear time and time again, the basics first, the basics first, the basics first. But you can cover the basics through lessons that help enhance the knowledge of countries and cultures. In fact, the Common Core provides an opportunity for you to innovate when it comes to global competencies as there's a strong focus on interdisciplinary or integrated learning. So we as an organization have two areas we're, we're focusing on right now in terms of integrating Common Core with global themes, and that's science and math. These videos, our science and math videos, are incredibly powerful with students. You've got foreign destination-based videos with modern-day explorers. And how often do you get that, especially in a math class? So for example, we link kinetic and potential energy with bungee jumping in South Africa. We're currently developing a lesson plan on permutations as it relates to the game of chess, which is incidentally the national sport of Azerbaijan and part of their school curriculum. And here's an example, and this is a complete full video for you to see that we do, on how we covered the topic of fossil fuels while we were in Azerbaijan last year. Electricity can come from a variety of sources. These energy sources are divided into two groups. Renewable, meaning that they're easily replenished, and non-renewable, or fossil fuels, which, as the name suggests, means that they'll eventually run out. In America, nearly 85% of our energy comes from non-renewable sources like oil, coal, or natural gas. Today, we're gonna take a look at how those fossil fuels were created. Contrary to what many people believe, fossil fuels are not the result of dead, decaying dinosaurs. Fossil fuels are made from organisms that were once alive, but they were formed millions of years ago, long before dinosaurs roamed the earth. Fossil fuels are also made mostly from plants and from animals much, much smaller than dinosaurs. To understand how fossil fuels are made, we need to go back 300 million years ago to the Carboniferous period, when the land was covered in thick, swampy forests. Imagine our earth covered in leafy plants and thick ferns. Imagine spiders, millipedes, snails, and dozens of kinds of giant cockroaches crawling about. Imagine rivers and oceans filled with immense patches of microscopic algae cells. As part of the natural cycle of life, 
these ancient plants and tiny organisms died, and some sank to the bottom of the swamps. This formed layers of a soggy, spongy material called peat. Over thousands and thousands of years, this peat became covered by sand, mud, and rock. Hundreds and sometimes thousands of feet of earth covered this peat, and over millions of years as it compressed and gathered heat, it changed chemically and created fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are formed through a process called pyrolysis, which means splitting apart with fire. Chemically, what happens is an intense heat builds up within the peat from pressure of the earth above, but without any oxygen nearby, the peat can't catch fire. Instead, this heat combined with pressure makes the organic material break down and transform into a whole range of materials, including gases, solids, and liquids like petroleum. What took millions of years to create will likely be depleted in just a few hundred unless the whole world increases its use of renewable energy sources. Take Azerbaijan, for example. While this country is rich in oil and gas, the government is working hard to decrease its dependency on non-renewable sources. Oil has been good to the people of Azerbaijan, but soon, alternative sources like wind and solar will be necessary to keep the lights on. Incidentally, we had to jump a fence to get that video, which I don't recommend if you want to go out and be a filmmaker, but how do you visit one of the most oil-rich countries in the world and not cover the topic of energy? Now, this video is paired with two other videos, one that explores the history and impact of offshore drilling. Uh, the Caspian Sea was the first place where offshore drilling was uh, done. And the other is uh, on alternative energy initiatives in Azerbaijan, which incidentally they're investing very heavily in. We also interviewed a member of parliament and we asked him what the biggest challenges his country uh, were facing. And he said, preparing for the day when we no longer have oil. And he said, and I'm not just talking economically, I'm talking emotionally. So. Uh, that's, that was our approach to fossil fuels. Videos like this are designed to introduce students to issues of global concern, again, tying it back to uh, the science aspect. And the accompanying lessons um, typically challenge students to identify potential solutions. So that's just one example of what we do. There are over 400 on the, on the site, ranging from mini language lessons to introductions to world religions to an interview on the power of a vote with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, and I encourage you to go to the site. That's something tangible you can take back to your schools and start using next week to supplement your global curriculum. We're not there to be the sole focus of your global curriculum. We're there to supplement what you're already doing in the classroom. With that said, it's audience participation time, and we're going to tackle the second goal that I had for you today, which is to start thinking about ways that self-produced content or class-produced multimedia can enhance your global learning. So you should all have a picture on your table, and this is a great way for you to get to meet everyone at your table as well. Um, all of these are places that Project Explorer has filmed. And there's a brief description on the back of each of those photos. And that's typically what I, as a producer and filmmaker, start with, a very guidebooky tour company snippet of a destination. For the next eight minutes or so, I'd like your tables to brainstorm ways that you could explore this topic in your classroom beyond that guidebook touristy description that I've given you. In two to three sentences, and we will be sharing, if you had the perfect video on hand to show your students, what would the theme of that video be? So that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna spend roughly eight to 10 minutes and you are gonna pitch me your video topics. Go. All right, so let's begin. What tables have the Sydney Harbor Bridge? It's a beautiful bridge and I climbed it less than 30 days ago. So you get to climb to the top actually. Um, can one of the tables start by reading the description that you were provided? Because everyone was provided different cards. There are six different cards floating around. Who's got the description? Yeah, just somebody, can you read it? Today, 
Okay, so who would like to pitch me their dream scenario for the Sydney Harbor Bridge? We would. Okay, please do. Yeah. Sure. Um, our theme for our um, film is Bridging Communities. We would like to look at the history of Sydney Harbor Bridge and wanted when it came about and just the um, impact on the community that it um, had at the time that it was being built and then springboard into today and see how the bridge is what communities this bridge bridges and the stories of the people crossing the bridge how it's being used where are they going what are they you know, what are they doing and then taking a global perspective to end with and look at other similar bridges around the world and the communities that they connect. What's your name? Uh, Taya. Would you like to come with me on the next trip? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> we're very excited. We're very excited at this table. Okay. Okay. Did anyone else have a different pitch or would like to comment on that? When you said climb the bridge, you're talking on the, on the girders? Yeah. You'll be able to see that video. I just finished the, finished the draft on Sunday. It'll be up on the site within 10 days. Yeah, well, tr imagine doing that with a camera and a microphone attached to you as well. No. Yeah. Okay, so would you like to know what we, what, what the angle we took? And I don't have a video because, again, I said it, we just filmed there less than a month ago. In researching the bridge, we kept seeing two words, and that was on the description that I gave you. Arch bridge. So when I create a script, my team and I scrutinize every single word that goes into the script. So everything we do, especially in terms of like science and math, everything is scripted before we get on location. If we're interviewing someone, we just sort of wing it um, after we've obviously done the research on who that person is. So I literally go through, once I get my draft scripts, with a highlighter and note, what is this and why is it important to our three to five minute story? So as it turned out, those two words, arch, bridge, became the basis for a history lesson and engineering lesson. The Sydney Harbor Bridge is based on ancient Roman designs. And with this angle, we've got the option for an extended integrated, integrated lessons in art and geometry. So that's the angle we would have taken on it, uh, we took on it. Not to say that yours, it's, this is the joy of being a filmmaker and a producer. There are nine million different ways that you can approach these subject matters. And that's what I'm trying to do uh, to get you guys to do to, uh, today is think about images and video in different ways. So we're gonna move on to the next one. Who had the Thai fish market in the Andaman Sea? Would you like to read the description and tell us your pitch with your nice, loud classroom teacher voice? <laughs> it's the Andaman Sea. And what, what's your name, please? Uh, Heather Worthy. Heather, what's your, what's your table's pitch for this? Okay, so, <laughs> okay, yeah. All right, so we were talking about starting with um, the local, so the visual of your student, or the person sitting down to a fish that they're about to eat, um, taking it back to where does it come from, it comes from the grocery store, taking them to the grocery store where they get their fish, um, and then saying, wait, no, take them on a map, take them all the way over to Thailand so that they can see if the fish comes from there, take them into the uh, work uh, area so that we're looking at that dating moment where they're having the dating back and forth, um, and then having a conversation with uh, the fishermen about where the fish comes from and how do they decide uh, what fish they're going to fish for, do they get to keep any of the fish for themselves, do they sell over the end locally or further away, has it affected their eating um, and what they get to eat. Um, and then talking to the bidders about what they choose to bid for or whatever, um, and like what is like the market, what's driven, um, has there been any issues of like overfishing, things like that along the way. Um, and then they would go, um, we said that this is three to five minutes, right? Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is the challenge of... <laughs> Also, like they give you a profile of like Safeway or whatever grocery store. 
resource changes by the new fish so that they can see the differences because we thought this was tied to economic growth. Uh, that's that's one of the angles we took. Actually, I have I have a video for this one. Um, it is a five minute video, and I've pulled out about forty five seconds for you to see some of the visuals we use. Because we, I mean, yours is great. You storyboarded the whole thing. I should just go back and refilm this now. Um, so let me show you that forty five seconds. Thailand has about two thousand miles of coastline. Coastal fishing communities depend on the sea and its offerings in order to maintain their livelihood. Fishing is important to the Thai economy. The government has stepped in to combat the threat of overfishing. One of the ways that they're doing this is by dropping old army tanks and buses into the sea to create artificial coral reefs where fish can reproduce. Okay, so we obviously took the environmental angle on that one. The great thing with filming, and I think I've now filmed in about 20 countries, is Waterways and marine life are always, pretty much always, a recurring theme. So some of the things you mentioned we've filmed in other locations, um, not just in Thailand. And when you go to our website, if there's related content from another country, you see it that way. So you may start with an environmental issue in Thailand and then do a local fishing community in India, so you sort of see the big picture. So we have to keep getting creative when it comes to waterways and marine life. And some of the things we've done, obviously, are conservation efforts. We just did in um, Malaysia conservation efforts in mangrove forest. We've done the science of tsunamis. Um, and that was partnered with Petra Nemkova's uh, story of being a uh, tsunami survivor. We've also done marine chronometers and the invention of time zones um, and the respiratory cycle of fish. So we have to get increasingly creative with what we're doing. Um, and of course, local Local economies and sustainable fish, fish practices, as, you, as you've seen. And if you'd like, um, I'd like to steal some of those so when we go to Turkey, we can <laughs> film those ideas that you had. This was part of my plan to get some new ideas. All right, who had the elephant orphanage in Zambia? Yeah? I'll read the quick description, and if you want to give us the pitch. So the Lilai Elephant Orphanage is home to six rescued elephant cats. Here, dedicated care is provided um, to get the calves through the vital and vulnerable early months and years of rehabilitation, and before they're taken to, before they're taken to a release facility and eventually reintegrated with wild elephants in a national park. Again, this video is not ready. I filmed it about three months ago, um, but it will be ready at the start of the year. So I would like to hear your pitch, and this is our presenter and yes, she got to, we got to all feed the baby elephants with bottles, which is probably one of the highlights of my life. Would you like to pitch us, please? So we were talking about the economic climate of the ocean and how this all relates to what's going on here in terms of who is out of this That's exactly the angle we took, with the exception of interviewing poachers, because they're not going to be on camera, because we're sponsored by local governments, so there's no way. Um, we, we, t we have, uh, so a lot of our videos have two to three versions, depending on the student. Um, for the high school students um, and the older, uh, we took this to be mass killings of elephants and rhinos in southern Africa. Um, and both versions discuss the near round-the-clock care that's needed for orphan elephants. Um, it takes elephants 10, like fact, it takes elephants seven to 10 years to learn how to eat on their own because their trunk has 100,000 muscles in it. So imagine like your body has about 800 muscles, they have 100,000. So imagine how long it takes to master that. So when they're orphaned, um, they need to be bottle fed every three hours, four, five to seven years. Um, so that's the kind of care that goes into rescuing an orphan elephant. Um, so we talk about that, but then from a high school perspective, we talk about the cultural reasons and the economic reasons that are um, behind poaching. And then some of the steps being taken by governments and NGOs to prote uh, protect vulnerable populations. So we're right on the same page with what we did. Who had a private helicopter tour over Mauritius? Would you like me to read the description and you'll pitch it? 
Okay, so enjoy a private helicopter tour over Mauritius, a small volca volcanic island located off the east coast of Africa. During your flight, you will soar above a panorama of magnificent lagoons, pristine coastlines, and undulating sugarcane fields. Please pitch me your idea. Fantastic. We did the sugarcane as a separate video. Um, so those are some of the themes we addressed in that. So when we film in a country, we typically film anywhere between 10 and 40 videos within that country. So you can really get an overview of what's going on. Um, would you like to pitch your idea before I screen what we've done? That's fantastic. We cover that in the sugarcane as well, um, in our sugarcane segment. Um, and also, incidentally, Mauritius is the first place where indentured servitude, that's where the British Empire started, indentured servitude. So if you have Indian heritage, you most likely came through Mauritius um, if, you, if you are British Indian. Um, so we talk about uh, the transition from slavery to indentured servitude. Um, we took several angles on this. Um, one that wasn't mentioned, I'm going to show you very quickly. The inspiration for the helicopter first came from a toy, the Take Tambo. It was developed in China in the 5th century and as you can see, the blades on the top of the Take Tambo look a whole heck of a lot like the blades on the top of a helicopter. This ancient Chinese toy eventually made its way across the Asian continent and into Europe. the 15th century, it was in the hands of the famous Italian engineer and inventor Leonardo da Vinci, who used it as inspiration to think of different ways to make flight possible for people. Da Vinci is known for drafting all kinds of flight machines from human wings to parachutes. Okay, so we did two separate videos with helicopter and then sugarcane was its own video. So the, two, the words I picked up on for Mauritius were volcanic island. So we did how volcanic islands form. Um, and then the second, the second video you saw is the first half of the history of helicopter flight and then the science behind that flight. So lift, thrust, um, things of that nature. So that's what we did for that. And then you get to bring in a nice little art lesson because we all know arts are being cut from school. So we try to bring in as much art as, as possible. Um, we have two more quick ones and then I'm going to wrap up and we'll take some questions. Who had henna? Would one of you like to read the description and pitch it for me? And I still have it on my hands. I tried to scrub it all off, but this was another 10 day ago sort of thing. Okay, so this is a very, it seems like a very girly topic. How, what would your pitch be? Uh, we'll start with your table because you read the description. Yep. I love that you're storyboarding these whole things for me. <laughs> Great. 
Can we hear your pitch? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we did. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's, there's two things. You can see that, um, so this is in India about 10 days ago. Um, we all know that India has a large Muslim population. Do you notice that men are doing this? These are Muslim men. We attempted to find women to do this. Um, this is one of the, the women wouldn't be on camera for us. Their families wouldn't allow them to be on camera, the people that we found. Um, but interestingly enough, it is one of um, the few professions that um, strict Muslim women, uh, strict family, women coming from strict Muslim families are allowed to do because they're just interacting with other women. Um, but in a public place, being on camera, that that wasn't going to work. So that's one of the angles that we took that this is sort of a job opportunity in a community where women in the workplace is not very um, common in some communities. Um, and then to get away from the girly topic, we obviously put the science spin on it by exploring the natural dye in henna called Lawson. So you're all going to leave. There's going to be a test. In, that's the next slide. Um, and how the dye seeps down uh, through the pores connecting with keratin to create a bond between the two. So that becomes our science lesson. And incidentally, this is a 5,000-year-old practice as well. So you're talking ancient history, and it's been found throughout India and Egypt and the uh, majority of the Middle East. Final one. Oh, please, share. I love it. It looks like I have to go to other places and repackage a film now. So, Okay, so for the last one, who had curling? <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> uh, can someone read the description and pitch for me? This is our very last one. Well read. What's your pitch? I'm going to show a quick clip, but we used both. So we used the history and the how to use of curling. This is one of our longer videos. This is about six minutes, but I'm only going to show you about a minute of it. Um, we took on the science angle of this. Um, sports are great to take on the science angle, but we do both. But I hadn't thought about looking at different sports in different um, communities. So again, I think I need to travel and start repackaging some of this stuff. <laughs> Now that the stone is moving, a couple of forces come into play. First, let's look at how it moves and the friction between the rock and the ice. Unlike with ice hockey, curling ice isn't made glassy smooth by a Zamboni. Curling ice is quite the opposite. Before match is played, the ice is sprayed with tiny droplets of water that freeze on contact to make little bumps. These bumps are called the pebble because they look like tiny pebbles of ice stuck to the surface. These pebbles help the stone to glide more smoothly because less of it is in contact with the ice. I'll explain. Friction is found where two surfaces touch. 
If the ice were perfectly smooth, it would be in contact with the entire bottom of the stone. By making the ice covered in small bumps, less of the ice is in contact with the rock, reducing the amount of friction between the two. And of course, the less friction, the farther the rock will travel. Now what the heck is up with all this sweeping? In curling, players rub a flat, rough pad, almost like a dish scrubby, against the ice. By pushing hard on those broom handles, the sweepers create heat on the ice, melting a very thin layer into water. Where the ice is wet, it's very slippery, again reducing friction to make the stone travel even further. Okay, so for the younger students, we stopped with friction. For the older students, we went on to talk about the conservation of momentum and what happens when one stone hits the other. Um, so that's a quick look at what we do, and I love that you're all thinking like producers and filmmakers. Now I'm going to challenge you to do something when you leave this room. By a show of hands, how many of you are already using student-created videos in your classroom? How many of you are using them for global citizenship, global understanding? Okay, so about three or four. Technology and social media mean that any, means that anyone can be a, a publisher or a reporter. And in turn, anyone can ask their own questions. Three easy ways that you can start to incorporate global themes through multimedia into your classroom are use your own travel videos or create narrated photo essays. The locations that I selected, I, I chose them for a reason. I chose them because they're examples of things aside from the curling <laughs> that you would likely come across in your own personal travels. And this is the easiest way to create your own multimedia for the classroom. You don't need fancy equipment to do it, and you're all experienced at presenting, so you're natural on-camera hosts. You do it every day in the classroom. So during your next trip, con consider creating a short video and be bold, get in front of the camera. It doesn't take a lot, just capture it. Who knows if you're gonna want it later, just do it. I film everything even if I'm not working. So the second way you can do this would be to collaborate to build content for your classroom. Discuss with parents, teachers, or other educators who's going places, who have been places, and then ask them to do the same. Become a filmmaker. And as you've seen, you can quickly brainstorm ideas with them. So if somebody says, I'm going to Nevis, Look up a little guidebook description, take the 10 minutes, and ask them to capture something. You can always narrate it later. And finally, the longer term goal would be to create a classroom project for next semester or next year. Um, explore a global topic locally. You live in an incredibly rich and diverse city. Uh, cultural institutions and museums are usually open to interviewing, uh, having interviews conducted, having people come in and film as long as it's not a professional production. Um, so make use of that. So that's what I will hope you will do. So before I take questions, I just want to um, close by adding one of the most important tasks of an educator is to foster the next generation of global citizens, a generation that is better prepared to communicate in our rapidly shrinking world. While learning the basics is vitally important to one's education, we need more educators like you who will encourage curiosity by infusing lesson plans with global issues. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to welcoming you to Project Explorer. If you have any questions outside of our little Q&A session, I can talk to you about how to incorporate it into the classroom. And hopefully, I look forward to seeing some of your videos in the next six months to year. Thank you. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Does anyone have questions? Yes, please. If I could just ask oh, sorry. Uh, for folks to stand before the microphone here. Oh, wonderful. I will just help everybody here at the recording. Purpose. Thank you. Okay, I, my name's Kenneth Newman. I'm actually a native of Hyde Park. Anyway, and I've traveled a lot. Um, I happen to work in soccer, and I saw the five Fs, and I thought you should add a six F for football. Okay. <laughs> and I was wondering if any of the filming you've done worldwide and you filmed any soccer, whether it was at a local level or international professional game? Not yet. We've, I, for a sport perspective, we've done archery, rock climbing, curling, cricket, um, 
baseball because baseball bats are made, are made in Costa Rica, but not soccer. I will look into doing that in the next year for you. This is how we get a lot of our topics. If you're on Twitter, I usually say when we're going someplace um, and say, what would you like us to film here? So we are crowdsourcing ideas from the people who are using our stuff. So no one's ever brought that up. I will look into doing that I, in the I, next year. I could probably give you some good ideas. Excellent. Yeah, just come down to the microphone if you have questions, please. Hi. Um, I'm currently piloting a program on teaching about the ancient Silk Road, both addressing after your presentation the five Fs and global competence at the same time. Um, and a series we've been using, or I've been using, we just finished in the classroom to really dig into Central Asia today is Globe Trekkers. I don't know how you feel about it as a Well, person, Zoe, our host, is from Globe Trekker. So awesome. the girl with the short dark hair is actually a host for Globe Trekker, so we love it. <laughs> okay, great. Then um, there's an interesting moment when in the, in the final piece on the Silk Road, they go from Uzbekistan into uh, Turkmenistan. Yes, I have to get the right ones still. And the... Um, I'll call her the host for that particular episode, mentions that, you know, I'm traveling from one dictatorial country to one that's very dictatorial. And she said, they will not let us film anywhere except this particular archaeological site. And it's about, you know, like a 30 second piece. But, you know, I'm, as, a crit as I'm looking at it through a critical lens, I can see the frustration on her face. And so I'm wondering if on two levels, yourself as a producer and a filmmaker, um, have you run into challenges with government restrictions on what you're able to film? And if so, how do you or do you convey that to your audience? Um, we have run into it. You know, it, Azerbaijan was a very good example of that. Um, I, I film with a, a just from your, just so you understand, I film, I call it gun and run style. They're little tiny cameras, um, and we sort of sneak them into the country. <laughs> and if somebody says no to us, um, we'll jump the fence to get it done. Um, that being said, the, the only type of censorship we've ever had was in a, when we went into Thailand and when we went into Haiti, they asked us not to show any archival footage of dead bodies after their natural disasters, and I understood that. You can get to that point without showing those images, um, but we definitely, we express that frustration. Um, we express it... Um, when we filmed on the tube in London, um, they wouldn't let us film at certain places because it was a post 9-11 world and they didn't want those images captured so somebody could sort of plan with the footage we had captured. And we were very clear on it, like we'd like to show you this, but unfortunately the government won't allow us to film here. Um, Globe Tracker can't go in under the radar. We can go in under the radar because all of our gear fits in backpacks. Um, we're not going in with multi-million dollar productions. We run our entire organization just so you have an understanding on less than $400,000 a year and we reach five million kids. So, other questions? Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I've been, I'm Trisha Colson, and I've been inspired to try and do what you're doing with my kids. So, how should I start it? How should I go about it? I, I'm actually teaching in a very multicultural school, so I have kids from all over, which makes me really want to do this. So is there a lesson on there, or is there something you can give us? I, d I don't have a lesson, but if you talk to me after, I can give you some pointers. You don't need major equipment to do this. Um, I've done this in, I haven't done set up a, a program in the United States, um, but I have set them up in other countries, so in South Africa. They use um, flip cameras to do it, so you're talking maybe a $100 piece of equipment. Um, and then you just need iMovie, which most laptops are going to come with. So it's really, it's picking the theme. Um, but I can, I can, I think we should have that discussion very quickly offline or I'll give you my card and we can, we can work through that for you. Because I do have it for other countries. It's just not tied to our curriculum. Yeah. Hi, my name is Eric. Um, a question a little bit outside of the classroom. I'm wondering what are the one or two most important lessons you learned about starting um, an organization um, for someone that's thinking down the road. Starting a nonprofit? <laughs> yeah, something okay, like that. Okay, the most important lesson, and this may disappoint a lot, disappoint a lot of you in the room. Don't start a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> there are 1.5 million nonprofits in the United States right now. Um, 
if I started Project Explore today, we would not be a non-for-profit. We would very much be a for-profit entity. I started it in 2003. Again, online media was not something that was happening, so we couldn't sell it. It was not something we could sell. If I started this today, I would be making a lot of money off of it. Um, in terms of me saying not starting a nonprofit, there's probably someone doing what you're doing already. I would approach them. If somebody approached me and said, I want to start doing this and rolling this out for classrooms, um, don't start it. Come and, come and work with me because I don't have the resources to make that happen right now. I don't have the brain power. I don't have the manpower. But I do already have my nonprofit status and 10 years experience. So that's what I would say. Most of the ideas in terms of nonprofits, I would say 99% of the ideas in terms of nonprofits have already been taken. So you don't want to compete with people who've been doing that work for 15 to 20 years and have multi-million dollar budgets. It's just, it's so aggravating. I actually have a board member here today and she can tell you how frustrating that is, um, even with accolades and experience. And So I wouldn't do that to yourself and I, I know that's a little discouraging, but that's what I tell people all the time, please don't start another nonprofit. I have a question about global, um, global uh, and how do you connect the American classroom to um, like foreign classrooms to the American classroom. Are you thinking about doing projects in the U.S.? Because I teach French and sometimes I feel like my students don't even know anything about the U.S. context. They don't know much about other regions. So have you thought about connecting the American context to other classrooms? You were talking about projects in South Africa. Do you actually have I, um, ways of having them using your project? in that classroom? Uh, well, f f students in 40 countries around the world use what we do. Again, it's free, and when we film in these countries, the government usually supports us. It's usually the, the education department within that government that we're filming, so they're getting resources for that classroom. To answer your question, um, we're not thinking about filming in the United States. Uh, our Our organization feels if there's information in the United States that students need, there is a way to get it. Um, so that's just, it's not our mission to do that. Um, and in terms of connecting classrooms, there, again, there are other organizations that do that. I'm happy to give you the name. I know some of them were mentioned in the keynote last year as well. Um, it just, we have a very narrow focus and there are other people. So I'd love to partner with an organization that does that. I don't want to expand my programming beyond that. The biggest complaint people have about what we do is we typically film in two countries a year. This year was special. It was our 10th anniversary year, so we filmed in quite a few. Teachers are saying, please go film in 20 countries a year. So if I have more money, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to expand our programming. We're going to, yeah, hit everywhere we can. Do we have time for one more? We have time for one more question if anyone has one. Hi, my name is Kawhi Jackson. Quick question. I know you focus on um, elementary school, middle school, and high school. Do you think about in the future expanding it to college on a collegiate level? Because I teach um, uh, at a university and I have a whole section on international relations. So do you plan on doing that in the future? Um, well, college students do use our, our programming. We just don't provide a curriculum for it. I mean, honestly, anyone anywhere in the world can use it. So we have like a huge adult following too. Um, but not specifically, we're not planning on on, on marketing, but it is there. Again, if, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can tell you what videos would be good for that, um, for that type of academic setting. Okay. Thank you, everyone.